Hello and welcome to this emergency episode. I've been in Europe just trying to enjoy myself and yet cannot get away from the absolute fuckery that's happening here in the United States. But I'm back and I'm ready to discuss, okay? I have the full opinion here in front of me. It's 119 pages long and yeah, I read the whole thing, okay? Let's talk about presidential immunity as it stands today. Um, I also asked my Patreon community for questions and they delivered. So we're gonna be answering a lot of your common questions at the end of this video after we go through the opinion itself. I know that this has been out for over a week at this point, so you've probably heard some of this, but I want you to see the text and see the highlights and like, the, don't just take the media pundits word for it. Let's actually look at the opinion together, shall we? Great, let's jump in. So we're dealing with Trump versus the United States. Obviously, you know this. This is a case regarding presidential immunity. If you download the official slip opinion of the court, you're gonna get the syllabus at the beginning. This is just written up. It says right here, it's written up by the reporter of decisions for the convenience of the reader. So if you don't wanna read 119 pages, you can read eight and it'll tell you the highlights. So I just wanted to point that out for you as an option. If you're like, I don't have time for all that, you can read eight pages instead. Um, and you'll see here on the very first page, it sums up this case pretty well. So I highlighted it so we can just get a little, uh, uh, positioning of where we are right now. So this is related to the allegations against Trump related to his uh, actions uh, around January 6th. Trump moved to dismiss the indictment based on presidential immunity, arguing that a president has absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for actions performed within the outer perimeter of his official responsibilities and that the indictment's allegations fell within the core of his official duties. The district court denied Trump's motion to dismiss, holding that former presidents do not possess federal criminal immunity for any acts. The D.C. Circuit affirmed both the district court and the D.C. Circuit declined to decide whether the indicted conduct involved official acts. Under our constitutional structure, this is what the Supreme Court has held in this case. Under our constitutional structure of separated powers, the nature of presidential power entitles a former president to absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for actions within his conclusive and preclusive constitutional authority. And he is entitled to at least presumptive immunity from prosecution for all his official acts. There is no immunity for unofficial acts. And then it goes on to quote, parts of the decision to give you the highlights. Again, this is a great uh, resource for you if you don't want to read the whole thing. It's at the beginning of the slip opinion. It says syllabus at the top so you know which section you're in. I'm scrolling through the syllabus so that we can get to the actual opinion because I wanna read the words. You know, I tend not to hang out on the syllabus because I want to read the actual words. So we have Donald J. Trump versus the United States. Chief Justice John Roberts delivered the opinion of the court. Fun fact, at his confirmation hearing, he explicitly said he believed no one was above the law, including the president. So this is a pretty shocking turn, especially given that during oral arguments for this case, he seemed pretty on the side of not giving presidents complete immunity. So he did a real 180, one would say, from um, everything he's ever said or done prior to this decision being released. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, was there a bribe behind the scenes and under the table deal? Given the ethics of this court, I'm not alleging anything, but uh, it wouldn't be shocking, let's say that. So here at the beginning, he lays out, we consider the scope of a president's immunity from criminal, criminal prosecution. And then he lays out the claims, both as the government has claimed them and as Trump has claimed them. And I wanted to note this because the juxtaposition of what the government claims and what Trump claims is a very classic example of Trump's tendency in life and in law to play down the inappropriateness and sometimes criminality of his actions by gaslighting the shit out of people and telling him them what he's doing is totally normal. We saw it in the hush money case, both in words he said about it, but also in the words his lawyers said during that case. We're seeing it here now. And um, yeah, the court fell for it. Love that. So basically he was just doing his official job. He was just doing his job. He was just having a little conversation, okay? There's nothing weird about this. Why are you being so weird? Why are you overreacting? Okay. Trump argued that all of the indictment's allegations fell within the core of his official duties, and he contended that a president has absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for actions performed within the outer perimeter of his official responsibilities to ensure that he can undertake the especially sensitive duties of his office with bold and unhesitating action. And the Supreme Court was like, hell yeah, they got a real hard on for bold and unhesitating presidents. They love that. Okay. So that's the background of the case. And the conclusion of the intro is this question. 
They are deciding the question whether and if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? That theoretically is the question they're they're trying to, to answer. They had the opportunity to make this so narrow. They had the opportunity to be like, in this specific instance, with these specific facts, we think X, Y, and Z. But instead they were like, hold my fucking beer. Let's go nuts with this one. Let's really lean into it. When life feels stressful and I get overwhelmed with the world, the last thing that I want to do is think about feeding myself every few hours all day long, day after day, and then also washing those dishes afterwards and going grocery shopping and everything else. It's too much. So I genuinely rely on my partner on today's video, Factor, to deliver fresh, never frozen meals straight to my doorstep that I can just pop in the microwave and eat. The meals are delicious. They're gourmet. They're dietitian approved. They're filled with actual vegetables and full of flavor. I recently had this honey mustard chicken and it was so easy and so delicious. Factor is especially perfect for summer. It's hot, we're all busy. I was just on a European vacation and then I came home, got a Factor box, didn't have to worry about shopping and cooking. I could just recover from jet lag and peace. If you want the convenience of delicious meals delivered straight to you, you gotta check out Factor. They have over 35 different menu options to choose from every single week, including specialized diets like vegetarian and keto options. So you can customize it exactly how you want. They also have snacks and breakfast and smoothies and juices, so you truly can go all out and build the meal kit that will make your life so much easier and as stress-free as possible in these trying times. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code LEGIA50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders for both new and repeat customers. That's code LEGIA50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. Thanks, Factor. Uh, so a few points to clarify. The parties before us do not dispute that a former president can be subject to criminal prosecution for unofficial acts committed while in office. We're on agreement in this. This isn't up for debate, but they still feel the need to dig in. They also agree that some of the conduct described in the indictment includes actions taken by Trump in his unofficial capacity. They disagree, however, about whether a former president can be prosecuted for his official actions. Trump contends that just as a president is absolutely immune from civil damages liability for acts within the outer perimeter of his official responsibilities, he must be absolutely immune from criminal prosecution for such acts. Okay, so this case is really only about official actions taken by the president. We are all in agreement that unofficial actions can be criminally prosecuted. What is a official action versus an unofficial action? The Supreme Court said, I don't know. You're going to have to guess. You're going to have to guess and then come back and we'll tell you whether or not you're right. I don't know. We're not given any guardrails, guardrails about what is official. Uh, it's just sent back to the lower courts, basically. The key to this is what is on the outer perimeter. So we got core official duties. We got the outer perimeter and the court is willing to read in a lot to the outer perimeter of what counts as part of a president's official duties. And we'll get into Fitzgerald, this case here that they're citing to. It's a civil lawsuit against Nixon for acts that he took while he was president, and it was brought after he left the White House. And the court in that case, in the Nixon case in Fitzgerald, found that the president can't be sued for civil liability. That's money damages. That's one person suing another person privately in court for feeling damaged in some way. They can't be sued for civil liability for their official acts. And this court here in this decision is like, great, close enough. Let's apply that to criminal acts as well. We have, we have this one decision, perfect. Say no more, let's run with it. But we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that further. So if we go down a little further, they have their conclusion kind of laid out here and then they, they dig into the details. So the ultimate conclusion, under our constitutional structure of separated powers, the nature of presidential power requires that a former president have some immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts during his tenure in office. At least with respect to the president's exercise of his core constitutional powers, this immunity must be absolute. As for his remaining official actions, he is also entitled to immunity. At the current stage of proceedings in this case, however, we need not and do not decide whether that immunity must be absolute or instead whether a presumptive immunity is sufficient. So they're saying um, core official actions absolutely immune. Peripheral actions related to it, his official acts, uh, also immunity, but we're going to keep it a secret about whether it's absolute or presumptive. Both, however, are bad. Uh, presumptive immunity would be where his peripheral actions are presumed immune from criminal prosecution unless the government presents enough evidence to rebut that presumption. So in either case, they're saying, yeah, he's got a lot of immunity 
and both the core, the core official duties, total immunity, unquestioning, complete immunity, all the peripheral stuff, probably also immune. But if it's, we're not sure whether it's complete total immunity or if it's like, we presume that you're immune, but the government can rebut that. We're not going to tell you that. And this is a secret. We're going to just draw this arbitrary line and then you have to figure it out from there. So then they go on to explain how they got to this brilliant conclusion. Congress cannot act on and courts cannot examine the president's actions on subjects within his conclusive and preclusive constitutional authority. Again, not really clear exactly what's in that. Didn't They didn't lay out a list, but one can presume that means the things explicitly mentioned in the Constitution cannot be criminally prosecuted for taking those acts, okay? The president is absolutely immune from criminal prosecution for conduct within his exclusive sphere of constitutional authority. Again, exclusive sphere of constitutional authority, pretty vague, still pretty vague. And then they go on more of their reasoning. The framers sought to encourage energetic, vigorous, decisive, and speedy execution of the laws by placing in the hands of a single, constitutionally indispensable individual the ultimate authority that, in respect to the other branches, the Constitution divides among many. So they are very concerned with the vigor and energy of the executive, which I think is a gross word, those words, gross, when applied to old men. Vigor and energy, yuck. But they are really, really harping on this idea that the executive has to have vigor. They have to be able to execute whatever they need to do in order to fulfill their duty in the presidency. And they're saying the framers definitely got behind this. They were like, this guy needs to be able to do whatever's necessary to get shit done. Ignoring the fact that they were literally just coming from a monarchy that they despised, wherein there was one executive that could speedily do whatever he wanted. But minor detail. Ignore. Ignore. So then we go back to Nixon v. Fitzgerald. Again, this is, I think, the one case they really rely on to determine presidential immunity. It is a civil case, not a criminal case. In Nixon v. Fitzgerald, for instance, we recognize that as a functionally mandated incident of his unique office, a former president is entitled to absolute immunity from damages liability predicated on his official acts. This is a civil liability case, and they are looking to it to determine criminal liability. Law School 101, civil criminal, generally you have to cite to criminal laws when you are making a criminal argument. You have to cite to civil laws when you're making a civil argument. If you are citing to a civil case when making an argument about criminal liability, that's gonna be a pretty weak argument, okay? Law School 101, lesson learned. But apparently Supreme Court, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Close enough. Uh, so similarly, they, they talk about Nixon a lot and uh, comparisons to Nixon are appropriate because he's the other president who has like blatantly broken the law while in office. Um, but they really willfully ignore a lot of the really important high points about uh, what happened regarding Nixon. Uh, for example, when a subpoena issued to President Nixon to produce certain tape recordings and documents relating to his conversations with aides and advisors, this is when the Watergate scandal broke, this court rejected his claim of absolute privilege given the constitutional duty of the judicial branch to do justice in criminal prosecutions. Because the president's need for complete candor and objectivity from advisors calls for great deference from the courts, we held that a presumptive privilege protects presidential communications. But then they went on to hold that Nixon did not have absolute privilege. And in that case, prosecution overcame the burden of even presumptive privilege because the judicial branch has to independently be able to carry out criminal prosecutions. That's what they found in that case. And as the dissent will point out, there's a lot of other language in that case that absolutely absolutely does not square with the majority's opinion as it's written. Even this sentence right here doesn't square with their reasoning. The court rejected Nixon's claim of absolute privilege given the constitutional duty of the judicial branch to do justice in criminal prosecutions. The judicial branch needs to be able to do justice. There has to be a balancing of powers. It's not absolute. But they're like, uh, but, 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 but it's fine. The things that they point to in this case are such weak arguments. It would not pass muster in a first year law school class if this was your argument, if this was the logical direction of your argument and this is what you were citing to. Any law school professor would be like, hey, this is not really an on point case. This is a real fucking stretch. But highest court in the land, it's fine. 
It's fine. The danger is akin to indeed greater than what led us to recognize absolute presidential immunity from civil damages liability, that the president would be chilled from taking the bold and unhesitating action required of an independent executive. I'd like my president to hesitate a little, you know? I'm okay with a beat, a pause. I don't want it to be bold and unhesitating. If it's gonna be bold, maybe hesitate, maybe think for a beat. I'm okay with that. Potential criminal liability and the peculiar public opprobrium that attaches to criminal proceedings are plainly more likely to distort presidential decision-making than the potential payment of civil damages. And that's the point. That's the point of criminal law. It is more severe when you're committing a crime versus committing something that may make you liable to civil damages. Yeah, it should make you pause before taking criminal actions. That's the literal point of our criminal justice system because there are consequences for those actions. Otherwise we have chaos, okay? And Jackson makes this point in her dissent and we'll get to that. Again, the logic, it defies, their logic defies logic. It doesn't make sense. It wouldn't hold up in a first year law school class. Again, they really, they lean into this. We conclude that the separation of powers principles explicated in our precedent necessitate at least a presumptive immunity for criminal prosecution for a president's acts within the outer perimeter of his official responsibility. Such an immunity is required to safeguard the independence and effective functioning of the executive branch and to enable the president to carry out his constitutional duties without undue caution. Okay, but, and I want him to have a little caution though, okay? You know, caution I don't think is a bad thing in a leader. You know what I mean? And they, they talk a lot about separation of power, independence of the executive branch, of the, of the branches. And they say this, they play a lot of lip service to it, but they don't actually acknowledge the fact that this ruling gives the president so much more power. And again, the dissent gets into this, so we'll, we'll get there. I mean, the dissent in this case is so powerful. Anytime that you are feeling a little disheartened about a Supreme Court decision, always look for a Sotomayor dissent and uh, it'll make you feel at least slightly better. So she gets into this. Okay, so then we get down here. And this is really, this is the, the kind of test that the court lays out. Uh, absolute immunity for those acts that are plainly official. The president must therefore be immune from prosecution for an official act, unless the government can show that applying a criminal prohibition to that act would pose no dangers of intrusion on the authority and functions of the executive branch. Absolute immunity for those acts that are plainly official, absolute or presumption of immunity for acts on the outer periphery, but we won't tell you whether the immunity is absolute or presumptive, and we won't tell you what acts are official or unofficial, um, and that's unless the government can show that applying a criminal prohibition to that act would pose no dangers of intrusion on the authority authority and functions of the executive branch. So we wanna make sure that there is absolutely zero intrusion on the authority of the executive by criminal law. That doesn't sound like a balance of powers to me. That sounds like one branch getting complete authority over the other ones. Hello? So that's the test. The government has to be able to show that applying a criminal prohibition to the act would pose no dangers of intrusion on the authority and functions of the executive branch. And the way that they are defining the authority and functions of the executive branch, even though they're not clear on it, sounds incredibly broad. Uh, they do make the point that as for a president's unofficial acts, there is no immunity. Yeah, no shit. The president can't go and murder someone for their own shits and giggles and get away with it. That's not really at issue in this case. Trump himself, through his lawyers conceded to that fact. And in fact, even conceded that some of the acts alleged in the indictment against him would be unofficial acts. So that's not really on the table. And then they say, distinguishing the president's official actions from his unofficial ones can be difficult. Are we gonna give you any sort of guardrails to do it? No, we're just pointing that out. The immunity we have recognized extends to the outer perimeter of the president's official responsibilities, covering actions so long as they are not manifestly or palpably beyond his authority. So again, incredibly broad reading. And so all that judges are gonna have to look to, to figure out is it official or unofficial, is whether or not the actions are not manifestly or palpably beyond his authority whatever that means. In dividing official from unofficial conduct, courts may not inquire, however, and this is important, into the president's motives. Another ruling that they made in this case that was completely unnecessary. They did not have to do this. They went this far 
unnecessarily. Such an inquiry would risk exposing even the most obvious instances of official conduct to judicial examination on the mere allegation of improper purpose, thereby intruding on the Article II interests that immunity seeks to protect. Indeed, it would seriously cripple the proper and effective administration of public affairs as entrusted to the executive branch of the government if, in exercising the functions of his office, the president was under apprehension that the motives that control his official conduct may at any time become the subject of inquiry. Again, quoting from Fitzgerald, that Nixon case, which is a civil case wherein they were concerned about random individuals being able to come forward and be like, hey, I'm going to sue the president for damages because of shit that he did during his presidency. That is very different from the criminal justice system wherein prosecutors, individual prosecutors, have to come forward to prosecute him for individual crimes and he can only be prosecuted once for each crime. This is not the avalanche of potential liability that opening a president up to civil liability presents. There are so many more safeguards, at least in theory, in our criminal justice system to protect against unjust persecution, prosecution, both. But according to the Supreme Court, no, no, no. If, if the president is open to criminal liability for his acts, my God, the avalanche, the avalanche that he would have to handle coming out of office, just the mere specter of that would make him incapable of performing his duties. It's unthinkable. So, so they're, they're, going, they're, they're explaining it more. The president may discuss potential investigations and prosecutions with his attorney general and other Justice Department officials to carry out his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And the attorney general, as head of the Justice Department, acts as the president's chief law enforcement officer who provides vital assistance to him in the performance of his constitutional duty to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. So they point to the take care clause. That's what that's called. Take care that the laws be faithfully executed. In that clause has been read a lot of uh, duties of the president that are not explicitly laid out in the Constitution, but that fall under the take care clause in that the president's duty is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And within the president's executive branch lies the Department of Justice headed by the attorney general. So technically, the DOJ is within the executive branch of which the president is at the top. And so they're saying his conversations with the attorney general are totally part of his official duties and therefore should be 100% immune from criminal prosecution. The problem though, is that Watergate happened. And we were like, hey, there should definitely be some protections in place so that the president can't abuse the DOJ. There should maybe be a little bit of a separation there so that he can't just like wield it as a third appendage to do whatever the hell he wants with. But I guess we've just decided that Watergate was fine or we're just willfully pretending it never happened. Again, they say Trump is therefore absolutely immune from prosecution for the alleged conduct involving his discussions with Justice Department officials. Any discussion he had with them, doesn't matter, completely immune from prosecution and can't even, can't even be brought up as evidence against him in a separate prosecution. Great. That's about as clear as they get when it comes to the actual allegations in this Trump case. That's about as clear as they are in terms of the outcome of their decision in this case on his liability or criminal liability for this case. The rest, they kind of just leave to the judge. Whenever the president and vice president discuss their official responsibilities, they engage in official conduct. Presiding over the January 6th certification proceeding at which members of Congress count the electoral votes is a, is a constitutional and statutory duty of the vice president. The indictment's allegations that Trump attempted to pressure the vice president to take particular acts in connection with his role at the certification proceeding thus involve official conduct, and Trump is at least presumptively immune from prosecution for such conduct. The question then becomes whether whether that presumption of immunity is rebutted under the circumstances. So they're saying, actually, when any time he was talking to Pence, totally immune, can't be used, can't be used as evidence, certainly can't be prosecuted for it. However, this official conduct is like on the outskirts. So it's not complete immunity, it's presumptive immunity. So now the government has to show that they've overcome that presumption of immunity. With respect to the certification proceeding in particular, Congress has legislated extensively to define the vice president's role in the counting of the electoral votes. And the president plays no direct constitutional or statutory role in that process. So the government may argue that consideration of the president's communications with the vice president concerning the certification proceeding does not pose dangers of intrusion on the authority and functions of the executive branch. At the same time, however, the president may frequently rely on the vice president in his capacity as president of the Senate to advance the president's agenda in Congress. So they're saying, hey, the VP's role in the Senate as the president is totally, definitely not part of the executive branch. 
his, his role in Congress, that's the legislative branch. We're talking executive branch functioning here. So totally separate from the president. However, it also does indirectly affect the president's ability to do his official acts in concert with the vice president. So I don't know, lower court, you're gonna have to figure that out, but we're definitely, we just can't draw that line today. No, 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 can't do it. Too hard. The alleged conduct largely consists of Trump's communications in the form of tweets and a public address. The president possesses extraordinary power to speak to his fellow citizens and on their behalf. As the sole person charged by the Constitution with executing the laws of the United States, the president oversees and thus will frequently speak publicly about a vast array of activities that touch on nearly every aspect of American life. Indeed, a long recognized aspect of presidential power is using the office's bully pulpit to persuade Americans, including by speaking for forcefully or critically in ways that the president believes would advance the public interest. He is even expected to comment on those matters of public concern that may not directly implicate the activities of the federal government, for instance, to comfort the nation in the wake of an emergency or tragedy. For these reasons, most of a president's public communications are likely to fall comfortably within the outer perimeter of his official responsibilities. Again, not only are they creating spooky delineations around what still constitutes official actions, including apparently every tweet he sends and every public address, not only is that spooky, but also this means that what they're saying cannot be used as evidence against him in criminal prosecution for acts that are criminal or, or unofficial. So any tweet he's made, any public address he's made, even though it's public, cannot be used against him. The breadth, the broadness of what they are saying is included in the in the ambit of presidential immunity is so broad, far broader than even remotely necessary in deciding this, this case before the court. Whether the tweets, that speech, and Trump's other communications on January 6th involve official conduct may depend on the content and context of each. Knowing, for instance, what else was said contemporaneous to the excerpted communications or who was involved in transmitting the electronic communications and in organizing the rally could be relevant to the classification of each communication. This necessarily fact-bound analysis is best performed initially by the district court. We therefore remand to the district court to determine in the first instance whether this alleged conduct is official or unofficial. And if you're like, wait, Legion, we just determined that texts, tweets, public addresses is definitely part of his official duty. Yeah, that's what they said. That's what they said. And then they said this. What does it mean? I don't know. And they don't know either. So they sent it back to the district court. And then this is where the court decides, no, no, we have to make sure everyone knows that like, this is not a crazy ruling, okay? We're being totally normal, all right? Trump asserts a far broader immunity than the limited one we have recognized. He contends that the indictment must be dismissed because the impeachment judgment clause requires that impeachment and Senate conviction precede a president's criminal prosecution. So Trump argued that a president would need to be impeached and convicted in the Senate before a criminal prosecution could follow, which is contrary to what the constitution literally says. It literally says, and I quote, judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. So impeachment, separate from the criminal justice system. We've understood this since literally the constitution's writing. And Trump's like, no, 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 I definitely would have needed to have been fully impeached and removed before you could ever subject me to criminal prosecution, which is absolutely insane. And the court claims to be rejecting this argument and taking a narrower view than the crazy stuff that Trump is asking for. But as the dissent lays out, they literally aren't. They're not taking a narrower stance than what Trump is asking for. They literally say, oh, so the constitution explicitly says the president can be criminally convicted in that part? Well, let's just ignore that. Don't look there. Look over here. If I close my eyes, that means it's not really there, right? So they're like, oh, Trump was so crazy for saying that. And then they go on and just give him complete immunity, even if he were to be subject to any sort of impeachment in the Senate, even though the Constitution says he would be subject to criminal prosecution, nevertheless, whether a impeachment happened, he still would be subject to prosecution under the law. The Constitution says that literally out loud. And they're like, nothing to see here. And then they attack the dissents. As for the dissents, they strike a tone of chilling doom that is wholly disproportionate to what the court actually does today. Conclude that immunity extends to official discussions between the president and his attorney general, and then remand to the lower courts to determine in the first instance whether and to what extent Trump's remaining alleged conduct is entitled to immunity. 
Oh, that's all that you did? Sorry, I must have misread all 119 fucking pages. Oh, that's it? They're literally doing what Trump does. They're making a sweeping, horrifying ruling and then saying, oh my God, why are you overreacting? That is not what we're doing. Why are you being crazy? And I don't think the fact that both dissenters are women should be overlooked, okay? They are being addressed in this opinion by Justice Roberts with far less regard and respect than is typically afforded to dissenters. Even when the main opinion addresses the dissent's argument, the tone of this is really condescending. It is a lot more vitriolic than you usually see when a main opinion addresses the dissent's arguments. And to me, personally, it feels like it's a man writing to these dissenting women saying, you're overreacting, you're being hysterical, this is fine, and gaslighting the fuck out of them and all the rest of us. And they again, they say the dissent's positions in the end boil down to ignoring the Constitution's separation of powers and the court's precedent, and instead fear-mongering on the basis of extreme hypotheticals about a future where the president feels empowered to violate federal criminal law. Yeah, because you just empowered the president to violate federal criminal law. You just said it doesn't apply to him. That is not a crazy hypothetical, okay? Their hypotheticals aren't extreme. They are genuine examples of what Trump has done or said he wants to do. It's again, playing down the severity of this ruling by just gaslighting the fuck out of everyone. An enterprising prosecutor in a new administration may assert that a previous president violated that broad statute any criminal broad statute. Without immunity, such types of prosecutions of ex-presidents could quickly become routine. So they're saying, without giving presidents this immunity, any prosecutor could just decide, mm, this broad criminal statute definitely applies to presidents, and then they'll go bananas. Except for the fact that we've gone 250 years in this country without the court ever addressing whether a president has to face criminal liability for his actions when in office. We have never, the, pres the court has never had to address this for 250 years. And this is the first time any president we've ever had has been criminally prosecuted. And they're saying without this ruling today, my God, think of the chaos. Think of the insanity that would ensue. But when? Point to, point to our history. For the last 250 years, we have assumed that a president could be criminally liable. And yet, under this reasoning, prior to the ruling, the threat of an out of control prosecutions of presidents has been around since the founding. Since the founding. And it's been fine. Again, our dissenting colleagues exude an impressive infallibility. While their confidence may be inspiring, the court adheres to time-tested practices instead. It's just, it's scathing in a way we don't usually see. Like things I think are getting personal in the Supreme Court chambers, okay? And then this. This is probably the, I don't know, this is one of the most maddening sections of this decision for me. In his farewell address, George Washington reminded the nation that a government of as much vigor as is consistent with the perfect security of liberty is indispensable. A government too feeble to withstand the enterprises of faction, he warned, could lead to the frightful despotism of alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge. And the way to avoid that cycle, he explained, was to ensure that government powers remained properly distributed and adjusted. Distributed being a key word here. And Washington literally said these words as he was voluntarily stepping down from the presidency despite no rules saying that he had to because of his understanding of decorum and the incredible importance of a peaceful transition of power for the maintenance of democracy. So to quote him now in this decision is actually laughable. And I'm not laughing though, because I'm mad about it. <sighs> So they just are cherry picking weird pieces of history that don't actually back up anything that they're saying. And then we go on to Justice Thomas's decision because he was like, hold my fucking beer, this isn't insane enough. Let me write my own. So he's concurring with the majority opinion, but also was like, let me, let me in on this. I got a few extra things to say to really make this go off the fucking rails. So we don't have to read all of this because frankly, it's stupid. Thomas is really, really concerned about whether or not Congress granted the AG the right by law to appoint a special counsel, being our channel special counsel, Daddy Jack Smith. Uh, he's saying, yeah, the, the attorney general did not have that right because Congress did not give it to him by law by passing a specific law saying that Daddy Jack Smith is now the special counsel. 
He's really, really invested in protecting the separation of powers against the creation of a king when it comes to the attorney general creating special counsels and appointing special counsels without explicit permission from Congress. But he's really, really fine with the president doing whatever the fuck he wants without criminal liability so long as the president can generally point to some vague argument about official acts, at which point he has absolute immunity. It's this weird fake concern with maintaining the status quo and decorum that is thinly veiling absolute insanity, wherein Thomas believes that the president should be able to do whatever the fuck he wants and everyone else has to abide by a set of very specific rules. The constitution provides for an energetic executive because such an executive is essential to the security of liberty. So he's really concerned about separation of powers, but he really thinks that an energetic executive is required to secure our liberty. So do you want a king or not, Thomas? Because it sounds like you want a king and you're just saying separation of powers over and over to hide that fact from the rest of us unsuccessfully. Okay, and then we have Amy Coney Barrett coming in and she concurs, but dissents in one specific point relating to whether or not official acts can be used as evidence against a president in criminal prosecution. There, she draws the line. I do not join part 3C, however, which holds that the constitution limits the introduction of protected conduct as evidence in a criminal prosecution of a president beyond the limits afforded by executive privilege. I disagree with that holding. On this score, I agree with the dissent. And then she gives a, a helpful example to show how this is so fucking insane. The federal bribery statute forbids any public official to seek or accept a thing of value for or because of any official act. The constitution, of course, does not authorize a president to seek or accept bribes, so the government may prosecute him if he does so. Yet excluding from trial any mention of the official act connected to the bribe would hamstring the prosecution. To make sense of charges alleging a quid pro quo, the jury must be allowed to hear about both the quid and the quo, even if the quo standing alone could not be a basis for the president's criminal liability. You can't prosecute a crime unless you can provide evidence of it. The rules of evidence are equipped to handle that concern on a case-by-case -case basis. Most importantly, a trial court can exclude evidence of the president's protected conduct if its probative value is substantially outweighed by a danger of unfair prejudice. That is like evidence rules 101. The majority of acts as if there are zero safeguards in place already in run-of-the-mill criminal trials like rules of evidence to protect against the prejudicial nature of evidence or to instruct a jury as to which evidence they can use and how to use it. We've already figured this out in the criminal justice system. We have rules in place. It's been figured out. Yes, the president is in a special position, but as Amy Coney Barrett explains here, the rules would still protect him in these criminal cases, just the basic run of the mill rules that apply to everyone else. But here the majority is like, no, 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 no. He needs special, he's special, special boy. He needs special protections. I see no need to depart from that familiar and time-tested procedure here. Um, so Amy Coney Barrett, still siding with the majority, uh, but coming in with a little bit of uh, reasoned dissent, which I thought was interesting to know. But let's get to the real dissent here, written by Justice Sotomayor and joined by Justice Kagan and Justice Jackson. Relying on little more than its own misguided wisdom about the need for bold and unhesitating action by the president, the court gives former President Trump all the immunity he asked for and more. Because our constitution does not shield a former president from answering for criminal and treasonous acts, I dissent. Notice she doesn't say I respectfully dissent, which they usually do. Usually there's a level of decorum between the dissenters and the majority opinion. But like I said, the decorum's out the window. I feel like the back rooms at the Supreme Court are tense these days. So Sotomayor says, the majority makes three moves that in effect completely insulate presidents from criminal liability. First, the majority creates absolute immunity for the president's exercise of core constitutional powers. This holding is unnecessary on the facts of the indictment, and the majority's attempt to apply it to the facts expands the concept of core powers beyond any recognizable bounds. In any event, it is quickly eclipsed by the second move, which is to create expansive immunity for all official acts. Whether described as presumptive or absolute, under the majority's rule, a president's use of any official power for any purpose, even the most corrupt, is immune from prosecution. That is just as bad as it sounds, and it is baseless. Finally, the majority declares that evidence concerning acts for which the president is immune can play no role in any criminal prosecution against him. That holding, which will prevent the government from using a president's official acts to prove knowledge or intent in prosecuting private offenses, is nonsensical. And then she goes on to say, 
Whenever the president wields the enormous power of his office, the majority says, the criminal law, at least presumptively, cannot touch him. This official act's immunity has no firm grounding in constitutional text, history, or precedent. And then she cites to Dobbs. And I love this. This is shady as fuck. So she's saying, oh yeah, we've said before in this court, in the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, do you remember that one, conservative majority? You said that something has to have firm grounding in constitutional text, history, or precedent to be legitimate, right? Remember you how you said that? Uh, th that's not the case here, so not really sure what you're doing. Remember Dobbs? Interesting. This court loves to point to history and tradition whenever it suits them, and they love to cherry pick exactly what suits them. Um, but when it doesn't suit them, they willfully ignore the fuck out of facts and history and context, anything that is inconvenient for their argument. And they don't give a flying fuck about how obvious they are about it either. And then she goes on to be even more sassy. The majority calls for a careful assessment of the scope of presidential power under the Constitution. For the majority, that careful assessment does not involve the Constitution's text. I would start there. <laughs> Oh, it's shady. First, the framers clearly knew how to provide for immunity from prosecution. They did provide a narrow immunity for legislators in the speech or debate clause. Senators and representatives shall in all cases except treason, felony, and breach of the peace be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses and in going to and returning from the same. And for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. They did not extend the same or similar immunity to presidents. So she's saying they knew how to do this already and they didn't, and that matters. Second, some state constitutions at the time of the framing specifically provided express criminal immunities to sitting governors. The framers chose not to include similar language in the constitution to immunize the president. If the framers had wanted to create some constitutional privilege to shield the president from criminal indictment, they could have done so, but they didn't. That's also important. The majority ignores, however, that the impeachment judgment clause cuts against its own position. That clause presumes the availability of criminal process as a backstop by establishing that an official impeached and convicted by the Senate shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. That clause clearly contemplates that a former president may be subject to criminal prosecution for the same conduct that resulted or could have resulted in an impeachment judgment, including conduct such as bribery, which implicates official acts almost by definition. You cannot be prosecuted for receiving a bribe in exchange for doing something in your official capacity by giving someone a favor without using evidence of something that they did in their official capacity. Like it doesn't make any fucking sense, but the majority doesn't give a shit. The hist Okay, so she's laid out, okay, here's what the constitution actually says, doesn't align. Now she's laying out the history. Nothing in our history supports the majority's entirely novel immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts. The historical evidence that exists on presidential immunity from criminal prosecution cuts decisively against it. For instance, Alexander Hamilton wrote that former presidents would be liable to prosecution and punishment in the ordinary course of law. For Hamilton, that was an important distinction between the King of Great Britain, who was sacred and inviolable, and the President of the United States, who would be amenable to personal punishment and disgrace, which I love. She also cites James Madison. She also cites James Wilson. She cites Justice Story, who was an early Supreme Court justice. Over and over, she's like, look at all of the evidence that we have pointing to how our framers and the early people in our country who were deciding the laws clearly understood that the president could be prosecuted for criminal acts. Yet the majority fails to recognize or grapple with the lack of historical evidence for its new immunity. With nothing on its side of the ledger, the most the majority can do is claim that the historical evidence is a wash. It seems history matters to this court only when it is convenient, which is what I have been saying for a very long time. Our country's history also points to an established understanding shared by both presidents and the Justice Department that former presidents are answerable to the criminal law for their official acts. So. Now she's talking about Nixon again, because again, it's an applicable uh, comparison. And if you don't know, after Nixon left the office and Ford took over uh, because he was his vice president, Nixon left, Ford took over, Ford pardoned Nixon for any criminal liability related to Watergate. Both Ford's pardon and Nixon's acceptance of the pardon necessarily rested on the understanding that the former president faced potential criminal liability. In a statement by former President Richard Nixon accepting the pardon, 
He says he was accepting full and absolute pardon for any charges which might be brought against me for actions taken during the time I was president of the United States. The pardon, that statement, none of that would have been necessary if everyone understood, oh, there's no criminal liability for presidents for their official acts. Everyone understood that there could be. And so Nixon needed a pardon. Hello? Indeed, Trump's own lawyers during his second impeachment trial assured senators that declining to impeach Trump for his conduct related to January 6th would not leave him in any way above the law. They insisted that a former president is like any other citizen and can be tried in a court of law. Trump's impeachment counsel stated, if my colleagues on this side of the chamber actually think that President Trump committed a criminal offense after he was out of office, you can go arrest him. His own lawyer said that. In sum, the majority today endorses an expansive vision of presidential immunity that was never recognized by the founders, any sitting president, the executive branch, or even President Trump's lawyers until now. Settled understandings of the Constitution are of little use to the majority in this case, and so it ignores them. Like, this is why I love a Sotomayor dissent. She's saying the things we are all thinking. Then she goes on to address what the majority has written in this decision. It explains that at a minimum, the president must be immune from prosecution for an official act unless the government can show that applying a criminal prohibition to that act would pose no dangers of intrusion on the authority and functions of the executive branch. No dangers, not at all. It is hard to imagine a criminal prosecution for a president's official acts that would pose no dangers of intrusion on presidential authority in the majority's eyes, nor should that be the standard. Surely some intrusions on the executive may be justified by an overriding need to promote a objectives within the constitutional authority of Congress. Other intrusions may be justified by the primary constitutional duty of the judicial branch to do justice in criminal prosecutions. According to the majority, however, any incursion on executive power is too much. And then she addresses the Fitzgerald case, the one that this court cites to over and over again as supposedly supporting the idea that a president is immune from criminal liability. She says that the court decontextualizes Fitzgerald's language, ignores important qualifications, and reaches a result that the Fitzgerald court never would have countenanced. She's saying the court explained in Fitzgerald, when judicial action is needed to serve broad public interests, as when the court acts not in derogation of the separation of powers, but to maintain their proper balance or to vindicate the public interest in an ongoing criminal prosecution, the exercise of jurisdiction has been held warranted. So in the Fitzgerald case that this court relies on so heavily, they explicitly say in an ongoing criminal prosecution, Jurisdiction could be warranted. Jurisdiction is warranted precisely because it needs to be to preserve the separation of powers and the balance they create, which goes completely against what the majority says Fitzgerald says. The public interest in such private civil suits, like in Fitzgerald, the court concluded was comparatively weak compared to criminal suits. There is a lesser public interest in actions for civil damages than, for example, in criminal prosecution. So again, the Fitzgerald case was a civil case, but the court did consider criminal prosecutions in that case. And they said, no, no, there's a much different analysis to be had. The public interest in holding a president accountable criminally is very different than the public interest in holding him liable civil civilly. Those are two very different inquiries. The Fitzgerald court acknowledged that. This Supreme Court in this decision read the Fitzgerald decision and said, we're gonna ignore major parts of it. That's bad lawyering. That is like, again, First year law school bullshit you learn. Do not ignore major parts of a case that you cite to because it's gonna bite you in the ass. However, Supreme Court justices don't have to follow those rules because getting bit in the ass is not a thing they have to worry about because they are the ultimate decider and they don't have an ethics code that anyone can enforce. Its analysis rests on a questionable conception of the president as incapable of navigating the difficult decisions his job requires while staying within the bounds of the law. It also ignores the fact that he receives robust legal advice on the lawfulness of his actions. Like the president has many lawyers, they are in his ear constantly about whether or not what he's doing is legal. This is not a difficult thing to navigate for someone in the presidency. He can ask anyone around him and they could probably tell him. Certainly there has been on occasion great feelings of animosity between incoming and outgoing presidents over the course of our country's history. Yet it took allegations as grave as those at the center of this case to have the first federal criminal prosecution of a former president. That restraint is telling. Again, this is not a problem that we've ever had to deal with. This isn't a case where there's just going to be prosecutors coming in and indicting the pants off of every former president. Third, because of longstanding interpretations by the executive branch, every sitting president has so far believed himself under the threat of criminal liability after his term in office and nevertheless boldly fulfilled the duties of his office. It's a fake problem. They've made up a fake problem. 
One wonders why requiring some small amount of his attention or his legal advisor's attention to go towards complying with federal criminal law is such a great burden. If the president follows the law that he himself must take care to execute, he has not been rendered unduly cautious. Some amount of caution is necessary. After all, it is a far greater danger if the president feels empowered to violate federal criminal law buoyed by the knowledge of future immunity. I am deeply troubled by the idea inherent in the majority's opinion that our nation loses something valuable when the president is forced to operate within the confines of federal criminal law. Yeah. When presidents use the powers of their office for personal gain or as part of a criminal scheme, every person in the country has an interest in that criminal prosecution. The majority overlooks that paramount interest entirely. So this is of public interest. This is not a civil liability issue. Again, civil is very different than criminal. The majority seems to think that allowing former presidents to escape accountability for breaking the law while disabling the current executive from prosecuting such violations somehow respects the independence of the executive. It does not. Rather, it diminishes that independence, exalting occupants of the office over the office itself. To clarify, the DOJ is within the executive branch. So in saying that the DOJ cannot prosecute a president, the majority is putting the individual, the president, the person in the presidency over the office of the president in the executive branch. They're saying this one person deserves immunity and we need to control the DOJ from undue prosecutions. That is not giving the executive more independence that is hindering the independence of the executive by saying, no, DOJ, you can't do this. She says, the twist, there is a twisted irony in saying, as the majority does, that the person charged with taking care that the laws be faithfully executed can break them with impunity. Put that on a fucking t-shirt. Frame that. It doesn't make any sense. And then we get to a little more sass again related to the sphere of constitutional authority. Feel free to skip over those pages of the majority's opinion. With broad official acts immunity covering the field, this ostensibly narrower immunity serves little purpose. The majority struggles with classifying whether a president's speech is in his capacity as president, an official act, or as a candidate, unofficial act. Imagine a president states in an official speech that he intends to stop a political rival from passing legislation that he opposes no matter what it takes to do so, an official act. He then hires a private hitman to murder that political rival, an unofficial act. Under the majority's rule, the murder indictment could include no allegation of the president's public admission of premeditated intent to support the mens rea for murder. That is a strange result, to say the least. That's putting it lightly. And then we get to section seven, where she really lays bare the clear hypocrisy in this ruling and how clearly biased in favor of Trump the majority opinion is. The majority declares all of the conduct involving the Justice Department and the Vice President to be official conduct, yet it refuses to designate any course of conduct alleged in the indictment as private, despite concessions from Trump's own counsel. Basically, they're drawing lines in the sand to protect Trump that are very specific, but then in other instances are saying, no, 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 that's too specific. You have to just look at the facts. That's up to the district courts. We can't draw that line in the sand. That's crazy all to the benefit of Trump. Second, the majority designates certain conduct immune while refusing to recognize anything as prosecutable. Again, to Trump's benefit. They're drawing lines in the sand in some instances in ways that benefit Trump and then saying, no, 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 we could never draw a line in the sand there in ways that also benefits Trump. Looking beyond the fate of this particular prosecution, the long-term consequences of today's decision are stark. The court effectively creates a law-free zone around the president, upsetting the status quo that has existed since the founding. The president of the United States is the most powerful person in the country and possibly the world. When he uses his official powers in any way under the majority's reasoning, he now will be insulated from criminal prosecution. Orders the Navy's SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival? Immune. Organizes a military coup to hold on to power? Immune. Takes a bribe in exchange for a pardon? Immune. Immune, immune, immune. Even if these nightmare scenarios never play out, and I pray they never do, the damage has been done. The relationship between the president and the people he serves has shifted irrevocably. In every use of official power, the president is now a king above the law. Never in the history of our republic has a president had reason to believe that he would be immune from criminal prosecution if he used the trappings of his office to violate the criminal law. Moving forward, however, all former presidents will be cloaked in such immunity. If the occupant of that office misuses official power for personal gain, the criminal law that the rest of us must abide will not provide a backstop. With fear for our democracy, I dissent. Scathing, biting, love it. I mean, disheartening, but 
You love to see something written in such a way that it's like, oh, get them, get them, girl. Does it matter? Not really, because it's a dissent, but it's nice to read. Then we have Justice Jackson coming in with a separately written dissent. She says, I write separately to explain as succinctly as I can the theoretical nuts and bolts of what exactly the majority has done today to alter the paradigm of accountability for presidents of the United States. I also address what that paradigm shift means for our nation moving forward, which I think is helpful for us to frame my answers to your questions, which a lot of it is what happens now. So let's go, let's get into this. Our government has long functioned under accountability paradigm in which no one is above the law. An accused person is innocent until proven guilty and criminal defendants may raise defenses, both legal and factual, tailored to their particular circumstances, whether they be government officials or ordinary citizens. For over two centuries, our nation has survived with these principles intact. With that understanding of how our system of accountability for criminal acts ordinarily functions, it becomes much easier to see that the majority's ruling in this case breaks new and dangerous ground. Departing from the traditional model of individual accountability, the majority has concocted something entirely different, a presidential accountability model that creates immunity and exemption from criminal law applicable only to the most powerful official in our government. It doesn't make sense and it doesn't square with any aspect of our history. And then she lays out the new rule, which we've already talked about, and basically says, under this new rule, unlike everyone else who has to operate within criminal law where they're innocent until proven guilty, where they're charged with something and then have to prove a defense, she's saying, The president doesn't have to do any of that. The president doesn't have to deal with getting criminally indicted and then having to prove his defenses. No, no, no. For the president, it's assumed that he is completely immune from the law. Not that he has a defense to why he did the things he did, but that it doesn't matter. He's completely immune. He's above the law. That is very different from how all everyone else has to operate within the criminal law, which is that we could be criminally indicted. And then if we have a legitimate defense, we have to prove that first. Instead, now it's in the hands of judges to decide before any criminal prosecution can even go underway, whether or not the conduct, the criminal conduct can even be prosecuted in the first place. That puts the president above the law in a way that is completely different from any other conception of how our criminal justice system works. She says, in the majority's view, while all other citizens of the United States must do their jobs and live their lives within the confines of criminal prohibitions, the president cannot be made to do so. He must sometimes be exempt from the law's dictates depending on the character of his conduct. Indeed, the majority holds that the president, unlike anyone else in our country, is comparatively free to engage in criminal acts in furtherance of his official duties. The judiciary serves a newfound special gatekeeper charged not merely with interpreting the law, but with policing whether it applies to the president at all. Under the new presidential accountability model, the starting presumption is that the criminal law does not apply to presidents, no matter how obviously illegal, harmful, or unacceptable a president's official behavior might be. Regardless of all of that, courts must now ensure that a former president is not held accountable for any criminal conduct he engages in while he's on duty, unless his conduct consists primarily and perhaps solely of unofficial acts. So she's saying now the judges are the gatekeepers of whether he could even be held liable. That is completely contrary to uh, the way that anything else in our criminal justice system functions. Under the majority's immunity regime, the president can commit crimes in the course of his job, even under circumstances in which no one thinks he has any excuse. The law simply does not apply to him. Unlike a defendant who invokes an affirmative defense and relies on a legal determination that there was a good reason for his otherwise unlawful conduct, a former president invoking immunity relies on the premise that he can do whatever he wants, however he wants, so long as he uses his official power in doing so. Again, it just is reiterating the point over and over and over again that the president is now above the law and being treated in a special, special way because he's a special, special boy, different from all the rest of us. The court has unilaterally altered the balance of power between the three coordinate branches of our government as it relates to the rule of law, aggrandizing power in the judiciary and the executive to the detriment of Congress. The majority's new presidential accountability model undermines the constraints of the law as a deterrent for future presidents who might otherwise abuse their power to the detriment of us all. So she's saying the balance of power is completely fucked, not only because it's putting a lot of power in the president, obviously, because he's no longer criminally liable for anything he does, but also in the hands of the judiciary, who now are acting as arbiters of the law who are saying whether or not a president can be immune because they leave it up to judges to determine which acts are official and which are unofficial. So it's taking all the power out of the legislature or out of the hands of the people in the case of the president being tried before a jury of his peers 
and putting it in the hands of the judges to say whether or not he could even be criminally liable for something. And that's putting a ton of power in the hands of both the president and also themselves, the Supreme Court, the judiciary. And this is taking power out of the hands of the legislature because they're the ones who write the laws. They're the ones who are saying, hey, this conduct is illegal. But the court in this decision is saying, actually, it doesn't matter what Congress thinks is illegal. The people being represented by Congress don't get to say whether or not what the president does is illegal. The president can do whatever he wants. He has immunity as long as it's an official act. So it's taking a lot of power from the legislature and giving it to the president and to the judiciary. She goes on to lay out the consequences of this decision. If the structural consequences of today's paradigm shift mark a step in the wrong direction, then the practical consequences are a five alarm fire that threatens to consume democratic self-governance and the normal operations of our government. And she argues that we are not concerned with how efficient a president can be in making the decisions. Our Constitution's separation of powers was adopted by the Convention of 1787 not to promote efficiency, but to preclude the exercise of arbitrary power. The purpose was not to avoid friction, but to save the people from autocracy. So we're not really concerned about how quickly a president can make a decision. We want to make sure that he's not abusing his powers. And then she lays out a really interesting uh, inequity here. The majority tells us not to worry because like everyone else, the president is subject to prosecution in his unofficial capacity. But there's still manifest inequity. Presidents alone are now free to commit crimes when they are on the job, while all other Americans must follow the law in all aspects of their lives, whether personal or professional. The official versus unofficial act distinction also seems both arbitrary and irrational, for it suggests that the unofficial criminal acts of a president are the only ones worthy of prosecution. Quite to the contrary, it is when the president commits crimes using his unparalleled official powers that the risks of abuse and autocracy will be most dire. So we are more concerned with the president's abuse of power in office in his official capacity breaking the laws than we are in him privately breaking the laws. And then looking to the history, the vision John Adams enshrined in the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, a government of laws and not of men, speaks directly to this concept. Adams characterized that document as an homage to the rule of law. It reflected both a flat rejection in positive terms of rule by fiat and a solemn promise that every act of government may be challenged by an appeal to law. Thanks to the majority, that vision and promise are likely to be fleeting in the future. From this day forward, presidents of tomorrow will be free to exercise the commander-in-chief powers, the foreign affairs powers, and all the vast law enforcement powers enshrined in Article 2 however they please, including in ways that Congress has deemed criminal and that have potentially grave consequences for the rights and liberties of Americans. The majority of my colleagues seem to have put their trust in our court's ability to prevent presidents from becoming kings through a case-by-case -case application of the indeterminate standards of their new presidential accountability paradigm. I fear that they are wrong. But for all our sakes, I hope they are right. In the meantime, because the risks and power the court has now assumed are intolerable, unwarranted, and plainly antithetical to bedrock constitutional norms, I dissent. And that is the end of the 119 pages. Hi, are you still here with me? Great. I think it's important to have gone through all that because I want you to see the text of the case. It's really easy to listen to legal pundits talking about this, but you have to look at the text to fully understand what's going on. And um, I think you should read cases instead of just relying on talking heads to decipher them for you. But I'm also happy to decipher them for you. And to that end, I have uh, some questions that you've asked me over on Patreon that I have to answer. First question comes from Brian HK. What are some potential unofficial acts? Because it feels like all it needs to say is the magic words official act and absolute immunity activates. Relatedly, Fred Eater says, who decides what can be an official act and what can be prosecuted? So the majority opinion leaves that entirely up to judges to decide. It gives us some hints in both the majority and the dissent. So like hiring a private attorney privately, I don't know, murdering someone, et cetera. Uh, those would be probably private acts. So hypothetically murdering your wife or something like that probably would be considered unofficial because it's hard to draw the line from that to an official act. You could try, but I think it would be pretty reasonable to say that that was unofficial. But then he could say official act and it would depend on the judge. So it plays into Trump's wide swath of judicial appointments all across the country. He could get before a judge pretty easily that he could say, mm, that murder was, it was an official act, I promise. And the judge might agree. And there's nothing we can do about it because it's now in the hands of judges. Bluesmaker asks, what does this look like combined with Project 2025? This plays directly into Project 2025, the goal of which is to concentrate as much power in the hands of the president as possible. 
And to be clear, I mean the president, not the executive branch, because part of the executive branch is the administrative state. And we just had a ruling that gutted the administrative state, which is a huge part of the Project 2025 plan. And I will be discussing that decision next week. And it means that deference now, again, goes to judges and power has been taken from administrative bodies. So it's a combined effort where the president is getting more and more power supported by a deferential judiciary put in place by him. Not only supported, but legitimized by that judiciary because these judges can say, no, this is the law. This is, this is the result of balanced reasoning. And they can make their fancy law words sound official and give legitimacy to absolutely deranged policy. And that's how fascism happens, basically. John Mueller II asks, what can Biden do to scare the courts into rethinking? And that's something a lot of people are talking about. Like, okay, you just made a king. Biden should exercise his new powers as the current king. At this point, it wouldn't be enough to just scare the Supreme Court. What's done is done. They can't go back and rewrite the opinion they just wrote. They have to wait for another case to come before them on the same issue if they want to overrule a past ruling. But this is done. It cannot be undone. Biden could, however, scare the shit out of Congress. Congress is already scared and they're making moves. Uh, AOC said she'll introduce articles of impeachment for the justices. Probably won't get anywhere, but it's something. Representative Joe Morrell of New York said that he would introduce a constitutional amendment to confirm that presidents are not above the law. Um, and other than the Supreme Court overruling itself at some point in the future, whenever a new case could go up the line, a constitutional amendment is really the only way around this at this point. Congress can't pass a law that is contrary to what the Constitution says. And the Supreme Court is the one who says what the Constitution says. So Congress would need to change what the Constitution says in order to get around this ruling, unless the Supreme Court were to overrule itself, which is highly unlikely given the makeup of the current court. Um, and if Biden did something truly insane and criminal, I do think that that might be enough to move the nation to make that constitutional amendment, to make that change, okay? So like hypothetically, if he, I don't know, ordered Trump's murder, his assassination, just spitballing, that's just an example, it would probably create enough chaos to create the collective action necessary uh, to pass an amendment because it is it's a big it's a big ask it's a big lift and also like biden is really old so he could like take one for the team if he did end up going to prison like he's had a nice life you know what i mean he'd probably be fine another way biden could scare the shit out of the court is by introducing court reform now that that would probably be great um maybe a code of ethics or something maybe doing anything that would hold the court accountable to anyone other than themselves. I think that would scare the shit out of the court and probably win Biden some support, and he really needs that right now. Monica Starr asks, is this as disastrous and no going back of a situation as the media would have us believe? To which I say, potentially, maybe. The majority tried to characterize their decision as narrow and like totally normal and fine, but the reality is that they put this in the hands of every judge in the country, so it depends on which judge gets what thing to rule on. However, it will invariably always end up appealed back up to the Supreme Court, who seems very interested in protecting Trump's ability to do whatever the fuck he wants at all costs, okay? Which is where something like AOC's impeachment idea comes in, get the justices off the court, or alternatively expand the court, which would likely be more successful because impeachment is hard, but I don't know that a court expansion is necessarily the answer. Uh, but yeah, uh, is there no going back? I don't know. The potential for chaos is is pretty high and it's pretty spooky. But if someone like Biden were to remain in office, were to win the election this November, yes, he's old, but he still has a grasp on the basics of decorum and democracy. And we may have a chance of at least another four years of a uh, president not going completely off the rails and killing everyone and breaking the laws. So uh, please vote. Holy shit. Please vote. Um, you with the face asks whether the Supreme Court would ever move to restrict their own power more to then give the president even more power as divided between the three branches. I think that the Supreme Court understands their role in legitimizing the insanity of a Trump takeover and a descent into fascism, Project 2025 style. So I can see scenarios where their cases could come in and they'll limit their own judicial power and defer to the president more, certainly, but their role is incredibly important in legitimizing this as well. And we've seen that in other fascist states. 
the role of the judiciary in normalizing what's happening and saying, no, this is what the law says is very important. And they know that. Alan Duval asks whether this ruling negates Trump's pending cases or just makes them more difficult. That also depends because the court didn't give us any guidelines. It'll be up to the judges. So Judge Merchan, for example, in Trump's hush money case to decide as Trump's team has argued whether Trump's acts related to the case, especially the ones that happened while he was in office, were official acts and thus not even available to be used as evidence. I think it would be a hard sell, honestly, to say that Trump signing personal checks to his personal lawyer related to his personal business were official acts, even if they were done while he was president. But it could absolutely gum up his sentencing because the judge might have to hear arguments and post-conviction hearings. And yes, Trump will definitely appeal this from prison every step of the way if he does end up in prison at all. As to the other cases against him, they might be dead in the water. The majority opinion made it seem that the most of the things that he's accused of, like making calls to state legislators, moving boxes of official documents around, making public addresses to his followers to maybe instigate a riot or something, those are all related to his official actions, to his official duties. So the cases might move forward depending on if the lower court judges determine that they are prosecutable, but they would all likely be appealed right back up to this very same Supreme Court, which seems very eager to make these decisions. And I could definitely see Judge Eileen Cannon, the Mar-a-Lago documents case judge, jumping at this chance to fully just dismiss the case. But time will tell because the Supreme Court gave very little guidance in this decision. And then by far the most common question that I got was, what can we do? What is to be done? Help. Um, some people are calling to expand the Supreme Court because there's nothing in the constitution or anywhere that says that it has to be nine judges. Why don't we just add some more? And since we have a democratic president and Senate, add some more democratic nominees. Um, that makes me nervous because once the Democrats do it, open that door to adding more judges. Nothing is to stop the Republicans from coming into power and adding more of their own justices. It'll just make the court more subject to the whim of politics and politicians, which is definitely not meant to happen. It's meant to be protected from the whim of day-to-day -day politics. Court reform, however, should absolutely be on the table. Biden should be talking about this. He should be pushing for this. Term limits or mandatory retirement ages are really common in other similar countries. And term limits specifically would help insulate further from partisan politics because we would know when justices were scheduled to leave the bench and it would be in intervals that were predictable. We also really need a code of ethics and clear enforcement mechanisms for that code by an outside body. Their own written code that they have at the Supreme Court is trash. I made a video about it. It's unenforceable by any, there, it has no teeth. They're not doing anything about it. Impeaching, at least Thomas and Alito also wouldn't hurt, okay? And with a written enforceable code of ethics, it would be a lot easier to impeach them because the constitution says that the judges will serve during good behavior, but there's nothing that defines what good behavior means. And to right this specific wrong, however, a constitutional amendment is the only option. It's the only option. We can reform the court to hopefully prevent further erosion of our democracy, but for this specific immunity issue, a constitution amendment is the only option. Representative Joseph Morrell from New York has said he plans to introduce a resolution for an amendment, but then when I Google his name, news about him is completely dominated by his calls for Biden to step down because of his debate performance. So Democrats are spread really thin right now. Okay, and whether or not Biden should run has dominated the news ever since this Supreme Court ruling came down. So it's a really handy distraction for Republicans in many ways. And I know it's sh shitty, but you have to vote. Sorry, whoever ends up in the White House will be the one benefiting from this new ruling. Biden, despite being a walking corpse, actually has values about democracy and decorum, and that'll hopefully stave off a complete fall into fascism. So you do, you gotta vote. You gotta vote, you gotta vote for him. I know it sucks. Sometimes we have to do hard things, okay? We have to do hard things. That's where we're at at this point. So please vote. Thanks for being here. Next week, we'll talk about what is arguably an even more consequential ruling that just came down, completely gutting the administrative state and upending half a century of precedent. Thank you to my supporters on Patreon and YouTube. Shout out to my newest supporters, supporters of my royal tier, and an extra special shout out to my multi-platinum supporters, T, Latranger Lucas, Joshua Cole, Thomas Johnson, Sophia Sams, Anthony Giles, Tay, and Brett Piontek. Thank you for your support. If you liked this video, you'll also like my video about why the Supreme Court needs an ethics code. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.